Good evening, and welcome to the Lake Placid North Elba Historical Society's second program in the Winter Lecture Series. And tonight we're very pleased to present a program about uh, forest ranger history and search and rescue stories presented by Kevin Burns, who is the captain of the rangers and works here in, uh, what is it, Raybrook? And uh, Captain uh, DEC, okay, for Region 5. So we're very pleased to have him. Um, what, what's going to happen tonight is that we are going to enjoy a, a slide presentation by Kevin. And when he's done with that, we like to give the audience a chance to uh, ask questions or make comments. So Kevin will be happy to uh, talk to you a little bit after that. And then for those of you who brought... Uh, a raffle ticket, we'll be uh, having Kevin select the name and give out the raffle basket right after the program. So we hope you enjoy this tonight, and I'm going to hand it over to Mr. Burns and take off. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'll let you know I've already put my name in that raffle, so I'll, when I draw that name... Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. My name is Kevin Burns. Uh, like Chris said, I'm the New York State Forest Ranger Captain here in Raybrook, New York. Uh, the announcement they put out really gave a good history of my background, so I won't go into all the details. Um, but I will start out by saying, in 1988, uh, I started my career with the state. Can you hear me okay with the mic? 1988, I started my career with the state of New York. Ranger Peter Fish. Where is he? Ranger Peter Fish. For some reason, he picked me out of a group of applicants, hired me as an assistant forest ranger. I worked for Pete for two seasons. Some 33 years later, here I am standing in front of you folks. So thank you, Pete. Very nice. Great. So tonight we're going to go over um, we're going to go over the history of the Forest Ranger program, and I'm going to share some stories with you guys about some of the rescues we conducted over the over the years. Uh, what we'll do is we'll talk about the history a little bit, and then I'll go into a couple different scenarios of rescues, and we'll go back to the history. We'll break it up a little bit so I don't put you to sleep. All right. So, protecting lives and resources, the story of New York State Forest Rangers. The majority of this slideshow comes from this book right here. This is a, a book written by a retired forest ranger named Lou Kurth. Is Lou here tonight? No, unfortunately, I thought maybe he'd show up. Uh, Lou Kurth wrote this book a few years ago. A lot of great information in here. Hopefully after this lecture, you'll go out and buy one of these books or get it online, take a look at it. Great stories. So a lot of the information comes out of this book right here. Some additional books that I utilized, Fire Towers of the Adirondacks. We'll go over some slides here on those. There's actually some members of uh, this program right here in the audience, so you'll like those slides. But uh, yeah, those are the... Uh, the reference books I use to put this slideshow together. I'm going to walk around a little bit here just to keep my pace going, and uh, we'll continue here. We're going to start out with a rescue. Back in December, December 26, the day after Christmas, a young lady went up on the, the Dix Range and uh, tried to do the whole range. There's five peaks up there. She tried to accomplish the whole range in a full day. Ran out of daylight, ended up slipping up on South Dix, which is a very remote location. It's a herd, uh, herdless, trailless peak, herd path that goes up it. At dark, she slipped, got hung up on a ledge, was scared to move. It was snowing, got really dark, clouds are blowing. And she called 911. 
She called 911 and asked for help. Phone rings. The phone rings and uh, 911 rolls the call over to the DEC dispatch. DEC dispatch then reaches out to three forest rangers. The three forest rangers, they're, they're sitting at home having dinner with their family and the, I kind of screwed my story up here already. <laughs> Let me back up on this. So the, the Adirondack Enterprise, this is the article that was written. Woman lost, woman survives dangerous fall in South Dix. Rangers rescue hiker after hours in the frigid wet conditions. So the Rangers get called for this. Anybody in here get the Ranger highlights? I'm sure a lot of you do. We all read these stories and they, they, they basically just, you know, they really explain how, you know, how dangerous this was, how impressive it was for the Rangers to go in, in the backcountry and save this woman, bring her out of the woods, bring her home. What they don't read, what you guys don't read in those stories is that the Rangers are sitting at home having dinner with these, the families, with the kids, and the phone rings. They get the call, they answer the call, they decide they're gonna go out and help this woman. They basically get up from the dinner table, put the gear together, the wives, spouses, husbands, they're in support of what we do. Some of them will get us a cup of tea, a thermos of tea, or make us a sandwich, kiss us goodbye, and out the door we go. These three rangers did that. They left the dinner table. They went in the woods. They went all the way up. I think it was one in the morning when they finally reached this subject. They gave her some food, put some clothes on her, warmed her up, walked her all the way to the trailhead. Early morning, we say goodbye to that person. Rangers drive home. They pull in the parking lot of their driveway just in time to see their kids getting on the bus. So what I really want to point out here is there's more to just the rangers getting up uh, you know, in their car and going to the woods and saving people. There's a whole support network that, that's really important to us. My wife Erin, right here. Every time I got the call, every time I got the call, she'd be like, all right, I'm gonna make you some tea or I'm gonna make you a sandwich. I'm sure Robbie had the same thing. Robbie, Robbie Mikas right here. Where'd you go? One of the forest rangers. I think the only forest ranger who showed up tonight. So, so my point is that there's, there's a lot more to this than, than you read in those highlights. More, a lot more than we read in the newspaper. You know, there's a family involved with this. And uh, a lot of credit goes to the rangers and a lot of credit goes to the families that support us. This was that same night when the two rangers finally got to the summit. Those are the conditions they encountered that night. So kudos to those guys. All right, let's go into the history now. Conservation in New York State. Article 14 of the New York State Constitution establishes a state forest ranger, a state forest preserve in 1888. State forest ranger force was created as a result of this landmark legislation. And at that time, they were called fire wardens. <coughs> Excuse me. They were called fire wardens. Basically what we are today, the forest rangers. They're called for fire wardens. Today, there's approximately 150 rangers in the state. Throughout the, throughout the Adirondacks, most of them are throughout the Adirondacks and the Catskills. The ranger's job has evolved over the years. Back in 1885, our job was mostly fire. We still do fire control. We do a lot of search and rescue now. Public land management, conservation, and education, law enforcement, and environmental protection. 
Anybody hear of Rogers Rock Campground down Lake George? You all have, have you heard of Roger? Rogers Rangers? In 1755, Robert Rogers from New Hampshire was commissioned to form a ranging, ranging company to fight the French. They called them Rogers Rangers. There's a pretty good story about that in this book. Kind of confused as to why it's in the book, but as time goes on, I'll show you in another slide what, why this is really relevant to the story. But they call them Rogers Rangers, expert woodsmen. That's what you have now. You have 150 expert woods people now in the woods, helping people out and protecting the environment. <clears throat> Excuse me. And protecting the environment. So, they aided in the turn of the tide, you know, they turned the tide for the victory of the British. And we'll talk about these guys a little bit more in a minute. Mid-1800s, logging practices devastated the Adirondack Park. Misuse, there was no forestry practices. Basically, they came in and just pillaged the Adirondacks, took every hardwood they could. It was devastating. At the same time, outdoor recreation began. A lot of the wealthy people from the cities were coming up north, hiring guides, going in the back country, and they're, they're witnessing this devastation that we were seeing, or they were seeing back then. This is a great photo here. That guy boat is probably 100 pounds, and he's probably on a guide trip. He's got a guy there hunting or fishing probably going across the Hudson River with a log jam. I really hope that guy got a good tip. <laughs> There's not a lot of fish in there either. So back to 1885, the Forest Preserve Act. It authorized the creation of the Forest Commission, which is basically the conservation department today. It stated, Forest Preserve shall be forever kept as wild forest lands. It should be noted that this was the first comprehensive laws in America. Another great book that I would recommend is called The Big Burn. It talks about how the West, how the West was conquered with the same problems that we had here and how the federal government dealt with it. It's a really good book as well. But it authorized the appointment of fire wardens, again, forest rangers. It authorized the fire wardens, and it gave them the duty of go to the fire, put the fires out, hire whoever you can to do it with you. Oh, no, by the way, by law, you all have to help me. It's one of the, the advantages that fire wardens had. We can summon you guys to help us do this, and you had to listen to us. This is a list of some fire wardens between 1886 and 1891. Go down through the list here, Wilmington. Wilmington, any Davies in here? Does anybody know a Davy from Wilmington? Probably that same generation. Uh, Keene, Hale, do we know any Hales? North Elba, Parkhurst, any Parkhurst? Do you guys know any Parkhurst? No? Figured somebody would know one of these names. Well, I'm going to skip that one. So the logging continued throughout the 1800s. Old growth timbered was logged. The logging slash was carelessly left behind. There was no longer a canopy. And all that slash basically dried out. And forest fires, with the increasing lumber and the increasing recreational use we saw, we saw a tremendous number of additional fires in the Adirondacks. 1899, we had approximately 32,000 acres burned in the Adirondacks. 
1903, that was one of the big fires here that many of you probably read about. 430 some thousand acres burned that year. There's a few dry years between then and then 1908. 370,000 acres burned in the Adirondacks. Very alarming. And at that point, all these wealthy folks that were coming up, being, you know, hiring these guides, they were seeing the devastation, seeing the fires, and it became alarming to them. And it's basically the grassroots of the environmentalist. A lot of people started complaining about what was going on up here. There's a great photo. Anybody tell me where this is from? Not you, Pete Fish. <laughs> Guy Middleton, can you guess where this is from? All right, I'll tell you. This is the summit of Newmark looking across the valley over at Giant and Rocky Peak Ridge. 1903. Pretty interesting to see that uh, the cinders were falling all the way down into Albany area. This is a photo, a great photo of uh, people being shut, shut, uh, shuttled all the way up from Utica to help us with these fires back then. Long Lake area, 1903. This is Sabatis. Again, firefighters were brought all the way up from the Utica area to help out. At this time, uh, Long Lake West was a community, and uh, it was basically leveled by a fire caused from locomotive. This is 1934 Bay Pond Fire, approximately 8,000 acres burned. If you spend any time up north of Paul Smith College on the Blue Mountain Road, you'll drive through there, you'll see the remnants of this fire still there. It really has not recovered since that time. There's another photo of Bay Pond. So as time went on, the commission is now called the Conservation Department. This is a Model T truck, I think. I'm not an expert with motor vehicles, but I believe that's a Model T truck. That was uh, stationed right at uh, the Saranac Lake Barracks. Was uh, one of our headquarters at that time. And this, you can see all the equipment that was utilized for fighting fire. This one was out of Northville. Same setup. Should be noted that uh, about 1926, forest rangers were then mandated to wear uniforms. This is the type of uniform they were wearing at the time. Today's, our, today's vehicles, upper right hand is one of our fire trucks. We have multiple trucks staged throughout the state for emergency response for firefighting. Lower left is our new gray slash green truck. I, uh, I, I really miss my red truck, <laughs> really miss it. I'm sure folks in the room know what I'm talking about. All right, this is a cl classic photo out of the book from Luke Kurth. It's, it's arduous work. It's really hard to dig fire line all day. And I, I can't swear that I did not do the same thing that this gentleman has done in the past. A good story is I was working with a docks crew on a fire Docs crews are inmates crew, inmate crews, Mariah Shock. They'll bring in two crews of 20 people with the guards. They carry their lunch with them. They carry all their coolers with them. So we stopped, we had lunch. Following lunch, they packed everything up. The guards told them to put the coolers underneath the stump like you see here in this picture. I was like, that's not a good idea, you guys. And they're like, why? I didn't say anything. We went on. About an hour later, somebody cut the tree that this, like you see here, somebody cut the tree and it hinged back up and on top of all those coolers. They're just standing there like, oh no. So we spent the rest of the day come along in that, that stump back off the coolers. So the devastation of these forest fires, like I said, it didn't go unnoticed. Public outcry, new laws started to be implemented. Logging practices were changed. Open burning laws were put into place. Locomotive laws. We looked at the stream crossings. Those folks that came up from New York City were very worried about their, their watershed. Water runs downhill, so everything that happens here 
ends up down in New York City. So they were worried about the watersheds, wetlands. Today, we have a prescribed fire program here in New York State. It's ran by the New York State Forest Rangers. Last year, we burned probably just over 1,000 acres. And the purpose of the prescribed fire is to reduce fuel loading and to increase wildland habitats for critters. Right? It also gives us a really good understanding how to, how to train people to be better firefighters. It's a really good program. Today we have a number of fire, fire suppression trainings that we offer year round. Uh, we, you can see the lower left, right, right picture there, there's some snow on the ground. Early April, we'll start our trainings. And we'll teach people how to dig fire line for us, help us out. And we also have a program, we teach a 13190 federal course that trains people to deploy out west on western fires. And we'll do this annually. What they're doing on the bottom right there is they're deploying fire shelters in the event of an emergency. We'll do this annually so that we're trained. And when the West starts burning, then we go out as a crew. Last year, I think we sent five crews out West. Two of them went to Quebec. The other three went out West. And then we have a single resource program. Robbie is one of our single resources. Where'd she go? <laughs> Perfect. Let us get you some tea and a sandwich. Robbie's one of our single resources. Robbie goes out as a planning section chief and works in the incident command system out there. We all have our niches. We all like to do things. I work in the aviation world. Some people like the law enforcement aspect of our job. And I'll talk about that as well as we go. But this is a really neat program. So again, when you see out west burning, New York State is sending crews of 20 members out there to help them fight fires. Hey Kevin, if you back up, I'm not sure everybody knows what those shelters are that are being deployed or that people know there's actually a body under every one of those green things. Yeah, it's hard to explain that, thank you. Um, so fire shelters, they're, they're designed to, to protect you from extreme heat. They're a really nice safety tool to have on our belts. And what we're doing is we're teaching people how to de deploy them in a very, very rapid pace. You need to get under them in like 30 seconds to save your life. These are practice shelters. So we can roll them up again, put them in a bag, and have the next person try it. So yes, there are bodies underneath that. So you'll pull that shelter out, open it up, deploy it, climb in it, and then hit the ground and lay on the ground and hope for the best. Okay. So Mount Marcy, this is one of our rescue stories. This is a, uh, sorry, I'm going to forget the date. Uh, March. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to remember the date. I had it written down and I apologize. March, a phone call came in right at sunset. Uh, a mother and two children attempted to climb Mount Marcy. It was a beautiful bluebird day when they started. By the time they summited, the weather had socked them in and they lost the trail. They used an old flip phone, called for help. The old, with those flip phones, we just didn't have the exact coordinates of where these individuals were standing on the summit. We deployed four rangers right away. That year we had some good snow, unlike what we have out here. It is snowing, by the way, thank, thank goodness. So it was a very, very good snow year. Four, the first four rangers that went up there were able to take snowmobiles right to the summit. Right to the summit. They got off the machines. They patrolled an area and uh, were exposed to environments like you see in this photo. They shortly realized they couldn't stay there very long because of the weather conditions. So we started the second wave 
I was one of the members of the second wave. Drove up there on snowmobile. We weren't as, as crazy as the first group, and we parked them a little bit further down on the, on the trail down by Plateau. But I remember when I walked up to the first snowmobile up there on the summit, I looked at the snowmobile, and I'm like, where's the fascia? Where's this, where'd the windshield go? The wind had blew it right off that night. We lost the windshield that night. Fast forward, those four went down because they were exhausted. The three of us started searching. And uh, another crew came up behind us, started focusing on a different aspect of the summit. And uh, we were coming up with nothing. Now, this is a mother with two children in these conditions. It was brutal. It was brutal to think about them up there with no help. This is uh, right at first light. You can see our tracks coming from the other ridge all the way down through. This is the drainage that goes down into Panther Gorge. This is a typical place where people get sucked into. So we focused on that. Daylight came. We still had not seen these, these folks sitting up on the summit waiting for us to help them. The second crew, the third crew that came in behind us, the, the third wave, this is Tom Glitty. This is right at sunrise on the shoulder of Mount Marcy. And Tom Glitty is one of the most peaceful, friendliest, smiling individuals you've, you'll ever meet. He's retired now, but he's, he's an amazing ranger, always happy. Look at his face. <laughs> Brutal. Fast forward, one of the teams that came up at daylight was able to go up and over the summit down towards Lake Cure the Cloud. They picked up these, the, the mother and two kids. They were super cold, but they survived. They survived. I'll tell you this, I've been on a lot of rescues, and there's only a few that will get me choked up. That's one of them right there. <sighs> Excuse me. Anyways, we, we, we found them. We saved them. They're alive and well, doing good. All right. <clears throat> Sorry about that. All right, so back to our history. For Plank Colvin, conducted land surveys throughout the Adirondacks. He was one of the early proponents for the Adirondack Park. He wrote many reports suggesting preserving this beautiful landscape. I find it kind of odd if you've ever read books about him. He basically clear cut all the summits so he can do his survey. <laughs> or he would light a fire and burn the material on the summits. Moving on with our historical advocates. So the Fire Commission, or the Forest Fire uh, Commission, established in 1885. Colonel William Fox served as a deputy superintendent and a superintendent for this, for this commission between 1891 and 1909. He was born in Boston Spa, fought in the Civil War, wounded multiple times in the Civil War. His family owned a lumbering business and uh, as the commissioner, the superintendent of the commission, he, was, he recognized that the fire warden program was struggling. It wasn't doing so well. We were still seeing fires. We didn't stop the damage. So he wrote numerous reports in his tenure to the governor saying, we need a full-time force of employees to do this. We can't rely on the seasonal fire warden folks. We need a full-time force. And he recommended the term forest ranger. So that's when it was first introduced into legislation. Unfortunately, he passed away in 1909. Some of his comments, adequate force of forest rangers 
who should be assigned to a district of a suitable area. Patrol constantly and thoroughly. I love this part here. Should be required to live in the township. A cabin will be built for them. Do we have a cabin? <laughs> Good idea, though. So the, patrol, the, the, the duties of this new, um, new forest ranger ranks was to be always working on prevention and suppression. Unlike the, four, the fire wardens who were just there to fight fire when they started up. So his envision was awesome. Unfortunately, he passed away in 1909. Same year, sweeping amendments to the forest, fish, and game laws were signed by Governor Hughes. The forest preserves were di divided into four districts. We had three here in the Adirondacks, one in the Catskills. They came up with new positions at this point. Superintendents of fires would oversee these districts, and fire patrolmen would be the firefighters, or now what we call rangers. Sorry, sorry if I step on your toes, Chris. So, new titles. They, they got rid of the fire warden title. Now we have a superintendent of fires, and we have fire patrolmen. Um, pretty important on the bottom here. In addition to the duties of fire wardens, both superintendents and patrolmen were vested with the powers of the game protectors. So back in the 1900s, we had the rights to check people, protect the wildlife. We still do that now. And we'll talk about that when I get to the law enforcement. So by 1912, somebody actually read the reports from Colonel Fox. And the idea of employing permanent force was put into place. They were there to be protecting the forest preserve from fire, enforce the topping laws, and assist the surveying in state lands. The position of fire patrolman was now termed forest ranger. His idea came to fruition. Unfortunately, he passed away two years prior. So by the end of 1912, we had 50 forest rangers. 50 forest rangers who supervised 36 fire tower observers, 195 fire wardens that were used when the fire started. We would call them up, and we still have fire wardens today. We don't have a lot of them because we don't pay them a whole lot of money. They just like working with us. So the work schedule for a ranger is not like what we see today. Well, I beg to differ. So basically, uh, they work, they work uh, all week long. They get one day off, on call 24 hours a day. And they work until the job is done. I think we all do that. Basically, the, the motto of the forest ranger, get the job done. And we answer our phone 24-7. Bottom line, overtime compensation. Back then, they didn't get it. We do pretty well with the New York State forest rangers. We, we do really well with the overtime because we get the job done. So, at the same time, <clears throat> Excuse me. At the same time, during those fire districts that they established within the Adirondack Preserve in the Catskill and the Adirondacks, they actually renamed they renamed the position of su superintendent of fire. Now became the district ranger. They keep changing all these names. You'll get. You'll figure this out. It took me a while too. It took me fifteen years, twenty years. So anyways, they, they changed it from superintendent of fire to district ranger. And they also changed the forest ranger, like I said in the other slide. Now you have a district ranger and you have forest rangers. 
It's kind of what we have in place right now. I am the captain. In those days, I would have been a district ranger. And the patrolman worked underneath me. In the picture, the right, is a picture of Pat Cunningham. Pat Cunningham was a district ranger for District 2, worked between 1911 and 1940. Quite some time in that position. Picture on the left is uh, James Hopkins. He was a district ranger for District 1, which is basically this area we're in now. This is uh, an updated map in 1926 of all the districts. They expanded as time went on. District 2 was uh, North, um, North Creek. And District 1 is up in Franklin and Essex County. Excuse me. So, between 1912 and 1960, a lot happened. We had strong district leaderships, just like I showed you, with Cunningham and Hopkins. Infrastructure was developed. We had fire, um, fire headquarters like Saranac Inn. Ranger headquarters is one of the buildings that was established over that time period. Laws were expanded. Stewardship, majority of the time, was used on suppression and prevention. We developed a labor force, our fire wardens, and community contact. We live in that community. We are community members, and we're very tightly networked with everybody in these communities. Robbie lives in Keene. She's a, she's a community ranger. Weather stations were build, built. Moving on here. 1932, this is the ranger force in Albany. I get a kick out of this picture. They got a fire engine set up. They got the hoses laid out. They're standing with FDR. And they're wearing winter coats. Must have been a hot fire winter. Ranger Bill Petty. He worked in the Cold River country. He was only a ranger. I don't believe he became a supervisor. But this is a picture of him shaking the hands of Noah John Rondo, a hermit that used to live in the Cold River country. And uh, he used to come out of the back country, and they would take him to the outdoor sportsman's events, expos. And they would assign an ECO or a conservation officer and a forest ranger to babysit him so he wouldn't get in trouble. If you hike the Northville Placid Trail, you'll still see where his hermitage was located. There's a, a plaque and a stone pile with his name on it. It's pretty cool to see. All right, moving along. July 4th weekend, a 10-year-old walked away from her camp on Long Lake. It's a boat access only camp, and it parallels the Northville Placid Trail. Family called for help right at sunset. I remember the day I was working. Uh, there was a lot of thunderstorms in the area. Three rangers responded. Ranger John Chambers and Julie Hardjung were the first ones on scene. They entered the woods, went looking for this young lady. Pouring rain, thunder and lightning. It was just a miserable night. And John Chambers and Julie are standing there and just... He, John Chambers said he heard this faint little cry, and he thought his imagination was tricking him. He heard this little faint cry. And long story short, they found this young lady standing on a stone, a big boulder in the middle of a swamp in this rainstorm. He just heard that, and it drew him right to that sound. And uh, Ranger Pete Evans showed up on scene and helped carry this young lady out of the woods. John Chambers in the back with a headlamp on. I believe he retired shortly after that. So a really good, really good search story for him to end his career on. But look at how happy she is. Another quick search on Mount Joe, 1996. I believe Pete Fish was heavily involved with this one. A 59-year-old female hiked Mount Joe. She was uh, suffering from some health issues. Uh, had a stroke earlier in life, and uh, walked with a cane. She went up Mount Joe. Bingo. You were there? 
perfect. You were there too. There, I've seen a lot of news part and paper articles on you. So anyways, Margaret Laidlaw went missing on Mount Joe. Became a three-day search. Three-day search. Gary Hodgson, one of the local rangers here in Lake Placid, he was able to find her cane print on the summit of Mount Joe. And he followed that, intensely followed that off the summit and gave us a direction of travel for this, this um, missing person. Three days into the search, Chip Marshall, a local resident, was working on the Last Chance Ranch, heard a whistle, drew him right to her. And she was down near the river, Indian Pass Brook, suffering from exposure, but survived. Rangers went in, helped out. Ron Con was on that too. I'm surprised he's not here tonight. Um, another great find. Another great find. Last Chance Ranch. Paul was there too. Great. Last Chance Ranch went on a few weeks later and did an award ceremony. The William F. Fox Award that we now issue to the public for great you know, assistance to the search world was issued to Chip Marshall on that, during that event. Okay, back into the history. I'm hoping I'm not taking too much time here. Yeah, we'll be all right. Everybody good? Speaking of cabins, so we saw an increasing use in the backcountry. So the state decided they were going to start building log cabins in the backcountry and put rangers there. This is a picture of Shattuck clearing. Looks like the caretaker is either shaving or brushing his teeth. There's a couple more cabins, Lake Colden in the uh, early, early, early days. West Canada Lake, Johnsbrook Lodge. I love that picture. This is Lake Colden in the winter. Now the state didn't build the first cabin there. We, it was actually a hunting camp, fishing and hunting club that the state acquired. I think this is the building that they owned. Eventually they tore it down and built another one. Clint West, legendary forest ranger. He lived at Lake Colden Outpost. Now Clint didn't do a whole lot of firefighting out there. He was more of an educator. He went around, talked to the hikers and the campers and the fishermen and the hunters, and tried to educate people. This is Lake Colden today. In uh, 1998, the previous cabin burned. The wood stove caught the building on fire, burned to the ground. Nobody got hurt, thank God. That same year, the state of New York allowed us to build this cabin right here that you see in the picture. Beautiful structure. We built it out in Saranac Inn, piece by piece, disassembled it, and flew it in with a helicopter for seven days straight, one log at a time, and re reconstructed this. Bottom picture, my lovely wife, my son Eric, who was a caretaker there for two seasons. Kind of followed my footsteps for a while. I lived there for four, four years. That's where I learned how to ski. All right, moving on. Historical fire towers. Doug, you should love this. So fire towers in the early 19th century there, or the 1900s, uh, was, they were established to detect fires, get the jump on this, to see the smoke and call it in. They were manned. Earliest towers made of wood. I've seen a lot of deer stands that look like this. This is uh, Mount Hunter Mountain down in the south. Gore Mountain, Balsam Mountain. Great looking structures, huh? Imagine sitting up there on a windy day. So eventually, eventually the state started buying steel towers and erecting steel towers, taking down the wooden ones that you just saw in the pictures. A ranger by the name of Albert Tebow from Owl's Head. He was assigned to um, go around the state of New York and erect these fire towers for the observers. Uh-oh. Uh 
Yeah, wrong button. This is the map table that was, was set up inside the fire tower. And there's an alidade, that long steel rod you see there. What this gentleman is doing is he's lining up the smoke on his map and giving us an azimuth. And he would dispatch this information to the ranger, and then we would go look for that smoke. This gentleman actually, Ken Williams, went on to become the superintendent of fires, forest fire control, basically one of our bosses. So again, they were maintained facilities. Somebody lived there. There was actually a cabin at the bottom that they lived in. There was a phone system in place so they can call in the fires. During the World War II, their, their duties changed a little bit. They were not only looking for smoke, they were looking for enemy aircraft. If they saw enemy aircraft, they were supposed to call it in. There was a fire tower on Long Island. The observer on, on that day, he witnessed a submarine off the shores of Long Island, he called it in. They're like, wait a minute, you're supposed to be looking in the sky. Later on, they actually did arrest a couple German spies that were found on the island. So, pretty cool story there. Fire rest uh, preservation, restoration of the fire towers. 1970s, the state of New York started to eliminate these positions. They started using aircraft to do fire detection. They flew a lot more, and therefore they didn't need these folks in the, in the towers. So they started laying them off, not hiring new, new folks for these towers. They basically just went to the wayside. They started rotting. And then some organizations got savvy enough to say, all right, we're going to take ownership of these towers in New York State. You're going to help us fix these up. And today, I don't even know how many towers have been Restored. You got any idea, you guys? I, I don't know. A lot. Yeah, so amazing work by these volunteers. They basically adopted St. Regis Mountain Fire Towers, adopted by this group up in Saranac, Saranac Lake area. And they found the funds to repair the roofs, to repair the, repair the staircase. And then we would actually provide the helicopter to get the material up to the summits. Pretty cool. There's now a fire tower challenge. All right, keep moving here. I got a lot of good stories. Hope you don't mind them. Algonquin, 2016, February day. Two young kids from Niskayuna decided they're going to go hike Algonquin. 19 and 20 years old, male and female, boyfriend, girlfriend. They leave Niskayuna, go to the Adirondack Lodge. Start on another way up Algonquin. Beautiful day, and what do you know? The weather turned. They had phones with them, cell phones. They were taking pictures of themselves all the way up, posting them on Facebook. And uh, what do you know? They didn't come home. Their mother called us about 8 o'clock that night and said, hey, Maddie and Blake didn't show up and they're not answering their phone. We immediately dispatched the rangers. They got up from the dinner table. Their wives gave them tea and snack, and out the door we went. They went up to the summit of Algonquin. The weather was miserable. It's kind of a pattern here, isn't there? That night, the first group did not find these two kids up there. The next day, we brought in the army of forest rangers, army of volunteers. We spent that whole day looking for these two kids. We came up with nothing. I actually worked with Robbie that day and Chuck Cabral. And we walked up the backside of Algonquin. It was brutal. It was unbelievable trying to snowshoe up these, these drainages in deep snow. It was, it, was, it was a lot of work. We came up with nothing. All we had was a photo of these two kids on Facebook from their parents. That's what we're working with right there. That was the same day about the right junction on their way up. And they posted that picture. I went home that night, draped all my wet clothes out on the floor, dried them by the wood stove, climbed to bed, got up the next day, packed it all back in the backpack, 
I didn't sleep one bit thinking about these two kids. Couldn't get any rest. Got to the command post, and Scott Van Leer was the incident commander. He ran the show the whole day before. I think he was up on the summit the night before, too. He saw me, and he's like, man, you look wasted. You look so exhausted. I said, yeah, I, I didn't sleep. I was really worried about these two kids. He goes, how about if you be the incident commander, and I'll go up today? Okay, sign me up. <laughs> yeah, I did it. I, I let him go, and he was... He packed his backpack, and out the door he went, and I took over. What I didn't realize was I had to meet with this family and do a briefing with them, give them an update, where we're at, what we found, what do we think. And again, there's been a certain number of searches that I broke down and cried. This is one of them. I met with the family. I met with the family, and I gave them a full briefing. And I broke out bawling, crying my eyes out. State troopers are there. My captain is there. It takes a toll on us. It's brutal. The family was very thankful. They thanked us. They went over to the lodge. About 11 o'clock in the morning, Scott Van Leer, the gentleman that took my spot, Yells out on the radio, I've got him. I've got him. They were on the summit of Algonquin, off to the east, down in the crumb holds. If you can see this, really, you probably can't see the cable coming out of the helicopter. helicopter. They're down in that hole, and that's where we found them. This is a live shot of when we picked them out of the woods. Frostbutton, but they survived. We got them. Three days sitting in that hole. Go back here. Every Christmas time, we get a Christmas card from, from Maddie's mother. And she sends us email or text to our group saying, thank you so much. Amazing, huh? All right, I'm more than halfway, so bear with me. I hope this is okay. Recreational use. It took off. Starting in the 1900s, we started seeing a lot more recreational use. 1917, trails were built to these fire towers. Other, build, other trails were being built. Campsites were being built out. We, 1927, or early 1920s, we started seeing automobile camping. People were driving up from the city, parking on the side of the road, building campsites. 1926, Fish Creek Campground was opened up. Wilmington Notch was opened up. Forest rangers were given motorcycles, motorcycles to patrol these campgrounds with the sidecars. In the sidecars was all the fire tools to put the fires out. Recreational use continued. We then became the, the public relation ambassadors for fire prevention and outdoor recreation. This is a photo of Roosevelt's daughters on Long Island with the start of the Smokey Bear campaign. Everybody knows Smokey Bear, right? Please tell me you do. <laughs> Surprisingly, when, when Lou wrote, wrote this book, studies showed that 96% of the elementary kids knew who Smokey was. I doubt that's the case today, but we're trying. We still do PR events with Smokey. During the de Depression, the CCC camps were opened up. Conservation Corps, Civilian Conservation Corps. They were given jobs to make trails in the Adirondacks, make roads, fire roads. This is a shot of two CCC members sitting in. They were told to keep guard of this fire road and don't let anybody drive in there with their vehicle. And we still do that today. Recreational use is now an all, around, all year round event. We've seen it grow. Backcountry use in the winter has gone through the roof exponentially since I was working in Lake Colden in the early eight, uh, 90s. It's, it's you know, exponentially gone through the roof, especially when it's snowing. Okay, another rescue. Chicken Coop Brook. 
This is probably 2007. Uh, two individuals were bushwhacking off a Saddleback Mountain down Chicken Coop Brook. Gentleman was a New York City police officer, slipped, broke his leg. His partner said, well, I better go get help. He ran all the way out down to the Johnsburg Lodge, called us. What do we do? We get up from the dinner table and we go in there to help. Well, his partner didn't really have any idea where his friend was left. And we spent that whole night walking up and down Bushnell Brook, Slant Rock, from Bushnell to Slant Rock in the Johns Brook, looking for this guy. And we came up with nothing. I was on the second wave. As I went in, I knew where this guy, his, his reporting party, his friend, was camping. I went over and I woke him up. I said, all right, you got to tell me the story again. Where is he? We found out he was in Chicken Coop Brook. We finally got to him. Mid-morning, he was sitting in this brook right here. This is his shot. We spun up his leg. We called a helicopter. Helicopter came in to do a hoist to get him out of there. And I still remember this and to this day. Ranger Keith Bassage was in the helicopter looking down, and the winds are blowing. It was really rough. He's looking down at me. He's like, bye. We're not doing this. I'm like, oh, no. So we bring the Army in. We're waiting for the Army to show up. I started a fire. We got him out of the brook up on this bank here. I started a nice fire to keep him warm, waiting for the crew to come in to help carry him out. I look over, and the splint we put on him was on fire. <laughs> ten years later, ten years later, the Rangers are in Chicken Coop Brook again. This individual broke his ankle on the ridge trail in the winter. Robbie, I think you were on this. Yes, you were. Yeah. Uh, long story short, not to keep you guys here, 32 Rangers. 37 hours to get this guy out of there. It took forever. And they had a couple options. They either could go up and over Saddleback, which would be a technical rope rescue, or go up and over Basin, all the way down to um, Al Sable Lakes. Or somebody had the greatest idea, well, Chicken Coop Brook Slide is right here. Why don't we use that? And this is them laying this subject down right now. Long time, a lot of manpower. One more, and then we'll go back into the history. Nipple top, ice climbing. Gentleman was climbing a slide, very remote location on nipple top. He uh, slipped. His crampon came out from underneath him, wearing nylon pants. As soon as he hit the ice, he took off like a rocket. Suffered a lot of trauma, a lot of trauma. In fact, a number of times I didn't think he was living with us anymore on the way out. This one here took us 28 hours. 28 hours, I don't know the number of rangers, but it was brutal. We had a, we brought all the gear in, packaged them up, we had to lower them down the slide, and then we had to go through this bushwhack from the base of the slide up to the, the two tents you see. And it was just like this. It was just so thick. At times, we would take the litter and turn it between the trees just to get it moving anywhere. We had another crew coming in from the main trail with a chainsaw trying to open up for us. He survived. He, the, uh, I kid you not, there was times I looked at the litter. It's like, oh, he's no longer with us. And a few minutes later, he'd be like, let me out of here. It's like, oh, he's still here. He survived. Another amazing, amazing search, rescue. That's the picture of us belaying him down the slide. All right, getting into the good stuff. Search and rescue. You know, obviously, with the increased use of numbers, we're going to have more searches and we're going to have more rescues. It's just a given, especially during COVID. COVID, we went through the roof. Oops, sorry. July 10th, 1971. Eight-year-old Douglas Legg went missing from Camp Santa Santanoni down in Newcomb. Famous camp. The state now owns it. It's preserved. It's a historical site. Beautiful place. Beautiful place to go skiing tomorrow. Douglas Legg went missing 
on this summer day. Eight years old. Extensive search. All kinds of manpower. The state police ran this search, and it was overwhelming. What we call it is resource-driven. We are managing all these people that want to help. And we're so focused on managing that big group of people, we forget about looking for this, this subject we're looking for. This was a, a terribly ran search. Not trying to be negative. State police did what they could. What came out of it, oh, let me tell you this too. We are still looking for Douglas, Douglas Leg. If there's a clue, we will go look for that. If somebody reports saying, oh, yeah, I was there hunting and I saw something that looked like a, a bone, we'll go look. The state police dive team about five years ago went there just for training and they actually found a part of a skull. And we're all like, what? Really? Wow. Cold case. We might, we might close this. It was amazing. They took it to the forensic. Turns out it was a coconut shell. <laughs> so, moving on. The governor at that time decided, okay, somebody's got to take control of the search and rescue world here in New York State. By 18, or 1984, legislative authority gave the DEC Rangers the right to manage search and rescue in the backcountry. Bottom paragraph, organize, direct, and execute Search and rescue missions for lost people, lost persons, or civilian aircraft. We now have the legislative authority to do this in New York State. State police call us now. Pretty cool. Incident command system. We work underneath the incident command system. It's an organized, structured system. Most emergency management folks in the, in the nation will use the same system. Upper left-hand corner is a search. This is a morning briefing. We tell everybody what we're doing for the day, give them the assignments, out the door they go. Bottom right is a picture. I was deployed to Kentucky two years ago. The city of Mayfield was hit by a tornado. Picture downtown Lake Placid leveled in 60 seconds. New York went down there with 29 people to assist them. I spent Christmas and New Year's in Kentucky helping these folks out. They're bouncing back really well. Here's a video I'd like you to see. A winter day hiking right in Algonquin Mountains in the High Peaks Wilderness took a dangerous turn when a 21-year-old hiker from Saratoga Springs broke her ankle almost three miles from the nearest trailhead. At 2.25 p.m. on December 13th, DEC's Raybrook Dispatch got the call. We realized it was a very serious injury and the subject was not going to be able to move from the location that she had fallen. Eight forest rangers were immediately dispatched to the scene and began hiking in. Meanwhile, rangers explored all options for rescue. Uh, we tried to initiate a hoist rescue using uh, New York State a Police Aviation Unit out of Lake Clear. But high winds prevented a helicopter mission. As the first wave of rangers ascended the mountain, more arrived to assist with the carryout. When I got here, I was kind of like a second wave that went up, so um, a lot of the equipment and a lot of the gear was already up there. The first rangers reached the woman and her hiking partner at 6.45. She was very cold, so the first team that got there, their primary mission was to get the, stop the cold challenge because she'd been lying there for almost three hours at that point. Once the hiker was rewarmed and her injury stabilized, 13 forest rangers began carrying her out using a backpack litter system. On the way down, we're going through pretty treacherous terrain, uh, pretty rocky and icy areas. It's pretty slick. At 9.37 p.m., rangers arrived at the Adirondack Lodge and transferred the hiker to an ambulance. While forest rangers are highly skilled at search and rescue, rescues can take hours in the best of circumstances. And this could happen to anybody, so just be prepared, have a plan while you're out there, bring the right equipment with you, and if you need to stay a night, be prepared to do so. Among the responders were several recent graduates from the Forest Ranger Academy. They did great. Uh, all of them uh, impressed the, the senior rangers here. They all worked very hard. It was uh, amazing to see uh, their athleticism and their dedication to the job. I was very excited. Um, I mean, this is what I signed up for. I 
signed up to stay right here in the Adirondack Mountains and help people and protect the park. So. That was Joe Ordway and Ranger Pete Evans. Joe just graduated from our uh, last academy, and not to embarrass her, but to Ellie, Ranger Evans' daughter, sitting right here. All right, so after the uh, Douglas Leg search and the uh, legislative authority, Rangers started building out these teams. We started building out these teams and responding. They, they kind of had their own little niche for any search, um, any searches that, need, that came up and needed to be attended to. We, we since have gotten away from this pattern. We now use volunteers, a lot of volunteers. We, we train them, we have a basic wildland search course and a crew boss course that we offer to volunteers. There's some in here right now, Jeff Berry. A lot of volunteers in here, Sarnak, Lasar, New York State Federation of Search Volunteers. It's one, one phone call and we have just as many people as we see in this room show up at the search the next day. Amazing organization. Some of our other disciplines, we operate airboats. We conduct swift water rescues, high angle rescues. This is a drone video. We started doing, we, we started a drone team about 12, uh, 10 years ago. This is a, an infrared video of the drone operation. This is a training, it's not a real live search, but it'll give you an indication as to what this, what this drone can do, or UAS we call them. I'll just let it go a little further, you'll see a really good image of the, the person walking with their dog. A lot of agencies now have these UASs, and they have the same, the same platform we have. So people have been found in New York State using this, this tool. A great shot there. Cell phones. Cell phones. The evolution of cell phones <laughs> keep us really busy. Really busy. People have called us and said, uh, I'm at this junction, which way do I go to get somewhere? Or they've called and said, the bugs are really crazy, what do I do? <laughs> yeah, I'm out of water. You'd be, you'd be surprised with our dispatch hears. So anyways, cell phones, they, they do help out a lot, tremendously. We actually have technology now where if you call 911, they call our dispatch, they give a coordinate, we plot it on our phone, and we go, okay, I know where you are, we'll, we'll come to you, just stay put. Or we now have the technology where we can send them a link. We send it to their phone, they open it up on the link, and then we track their phone. And I could say to them, look, it's going to take me three hours to get where you are. You need to start self-rescuing. I'm going to give you this link, open it up, and I'm going to have you start moving, and I'll tell you if you're going the wrong way. I'll take a screenshot, shows it on the map, shows their track log, and I'll send it to them, and it gives them a little bit of a boost. They sit at it, and they look at it, and they go, oh, the trail is right here. It's amazing. The technology is going to help us, but it keeps us busy. Uh, Gothic's rescue. This is probably the worst day of my career. 21 below. At night, it was brutal. Two people hurt. They slipped on a slide. First person slid down, slammed into this giant boulder at the bottom of the slide, knocked himself out. Second person went to help him. Off he goes and down. Right into the same boulder, right on top of the partner. Uh, breaks his leg. Fortunately for them, three New York City firefighters were walking by them at the time it happened. These guys went to work. They were EMTs in New York. They started caring for these people. The young man who knocked himself out came to, was able to walk. They walked him out. They got to a phone and they were able to call us. We went in to get the second person. We said it was a lower leg. Rob Projackalo and I started in. It's like, we'll just wrap that leg up, just drag him down the trail. Because it was cold. It was super cold that night. We got there. We looked at this individual, and we realized it wasn't a lower leg. He had fractured his hip in five places. 
Now, we don't know that on the hill, but we know he was in pretty rough shape. Seven additional rangers show up. Julie Harjong is our, our true medic. She's now retired. She was there. She took ownership of treating this individual. She made the decision that if we bounce this individual down the trail, we're probably going to kill him. We're going to injure him more. He'll bleed out. We need to stay right here. 21 below. 21 below. That night, I took seven of us, seven rangers, three hours to get a fire going. Everything was coated in ice. Every limb had a quote, like an inch of ice, quarter inch of ice. So all the wood that we could find, just, it would just put the fire out every time we put it on there. The only way to stay warm was to walk down the trail a quarter mile, find some wood, bring it back up. It was brutal, you guys. The muscles in your back, the two muscles down your spine, started twitching, started shaking. We had to stand against each other's backs to keep each other warm. 21 below. Brutal. So we sat, we waited, we waited, and crossed our fingers that the helicopter could get this individual in the morning. It all worked out, the ship came in. Picture that, 21 below, and a helicopter's hovering above you as they lower a basket down so you can put this person in the basket and then hoist him out of there. We did it. But my gosh, it was rough. They picked us up later at Johns Brook Outpost. Again, we climbed in the helicopter. I probably looked just like I did on the Algonquin rescue. Brutal. All right, so 1930s, the state took on an aviation unit. We bought some fixed wings, started doing fire suppression with the airplanes, fire detection with the airplanes, fish docking. This was called the Goose, another biplane. Currently, well, early on, the DEC bought helicopters. We had our own fleet of helicopters. In the early, mid-80s, uh, the state police took ownership of all of those, and now they're the only ones that have the aviation unit in New York State. Quite frankly, the, the department couldn't afford to keep these up, so New York State took ownership. We use these for fire suppression. This is up on Blueberry down in Keene. There was a ground fire, and we're delivering water uh, backpack bombs full of water right here. 1990, we had an MOU with the Adirondack Medical Center and New York State Police to conduct hoist rescues in the backcountry. We're using their helicopters. This is our hoist program today. We operate all the hooks in the back. The hoist in the back is operated by a forest ranger. So when you see the helicopter fly over headed for the mountains, state police pilots are flying. Scott Catronas, did you make it here? No. One of our pilots. And the crew chief is a forest ranger in the back operating the hook, just like you see on the Coast Guard videos. They lower a hook or a basket. Forest rangers are doing that. Here's some insertions. Quick video. Whenever we hear Basin Saddleback, we always think back to uh, a major winter rescue that took place there for a broken ankle. Uh, that wound up taking 36 hours and 32 plus rangers in addition to volunteers um, to do the carry out. But that wasn't going to happen this time. Thanks to New York State Police Aviation and good weather, in the span of five hours, rangers performed two successful hoist rescues. It was an intense event for everyone involved. The first was near the peak of Mount Marcy, where a 40 year old woman slipped 30 feet on the ice into a rock and suffered multiple fractures to her leg. Ranger Lewis got the leg in alignment, splinted it, and harnessed her so she could be hoisted up. And all this, you're trying to do this as quickly as possible because the ultimate goal is get her in the helicopter because the helicopter gets her to the hospital in very short, short order. Pilot Scott Catronis flew her to the hospital, refueled, and then it was on to the next mission, where a 69-year-old slipped on the mud and ice at Saddleback and broke his leg. Ranger Lewis harnessed him for another hoist rescue. Both subjects required surgical treatment once they were in the ER. Um, so they were big deals. And, and those carryouts would have been um, incredibly brutal. 
They would have needed technical rope systems to get down the drainage while carrying the patient in a backpack carrier nearly eight miles. It was critical to be successful with the aviation mission. And they were. We, we were pumped up after that. You know, Rob and Pete and I and the pilot, Scott Catronis, we were all high-fiving and saying, man, that was great. Yeah. I used to do that until I got promoted. Uh, 1972 airplane crash up on the Sentinel Range. This is a picture of Gary Hodgson. He was inserted by that same, one of those helicopters to the scene. Unfortunately, the pilot had perished from this. Uh, at that time, we didn't have harnesses available, climbing harnesses. So Gary was savvy enough to just cut the seat belts out of the aircraft, tie this guy in a harness, and out he goes. Pretty much the, the, uh, the birth of our hoist program right there. All right, everybody good? Because I got a few more minutes here. Hope you're all good. Here's an airplane crash. It's a good one. Good story. I've been on a few that are not so good. So, big burn. This is, uh, yeah, I don't remember what year. <laughs> they're all blending in now. Three gentlemen from New Jersey decide they're going to fly to Lake Placid. They left New, uh, New Jersey on a beautiful sunny day. They get to Lake Placid, what happens? They get weathered in. They, uh, they basically overshot the Lake Placid airport. They were coming back around for another approach. Uh, they didn't realize how low they were. They came into a, a hilltop. They were going slow enough where the, the, the wing clipped a tree, spun the aircraft around, and pitched them right into the snow. All three of them were fine, no, no injuries. They get out of the aircraft, what do they do? They get their cell phone, they call 911. 911 gets the coordinates, they call our dispatch, the rangers get up from the dinner table, start putting together a plan, and coordinates come in on Street Nye, back by the Adirondack Lodge. There's been a number of airplane crashes at Street Nye, kind of makes sense. We have coordinates. We have three people that are okay, just cold. Two rangers start in. I was the second wave. I get a briefing from the ranger that's in charge. He tells me the story. I go back to my truck. I get my stuff together. And as I walk past the ranger in charge, I said to him, I go, this is really easy. Something's weird about this. This is too easy. Really too easy. So I start in the woods. I get across any Pass Brook, start heading uphill on, on Street and I, he calls, he goes, where are you? He called me on the radio, where are you? So I just crossed any Pass Brook, he goes, turn around, we're in the wrong place. He did some more homework. Not only did he do some homework, but the three guys sitting there waiting for us to come help them, they had connections to the Wall Street Journal in New York City. They called a friend and said, hey, we just crashed a plane, we're good, the Rangers are coming to get us. They tell that, that guy down in the city, I'm not sure where he was, he may have been in Jersey, New Jersey, but that guy watches the news, and they say rangers are going up street and I looking for these individuals. He calls his buddy back and goes, hey, the rangers are looking for you in the wrong place. Kind of a sad story, we're in the wrong place, but. So that guy is sitting in the, on the ground with his two buddies that just crashed a plane, calls and says, hey, you guys are in the wrong place. Okay. We hustle. We get over to Lake Placid Club Road. This, is a, this crash ends up being up on uh, the McKenzie Range. Big burn. Up in the Penny Glades. Everybody knows where that is. So, we start in. First ranger, who was fresh, wasn't coming off the other site. He starts in. He's got the coordinates. He starts in. There's a ton of snow on the ground. The canopy is covered with snow. There's three feet of snow on the tree limbs. Chris gets up to the location, starts screaming for these people. He gets no reply. Gets on the radio and goes, there's nobody here. Like, oh no, are we in the wrong place again? Long story short, he just couldn't hear them calling back. We found these guys. We found them about 1.30 in the morning. This is the actual photo of me walking up to the airplane crash. The three individuals actually got underneath the tarp. You can see their heads. 
They used a tarp that covers the airplane and made himself a shelter. You can't see it in this video, in the picture, because it, it's not a video, but they were shaking like this when we got there. The first thing they said to me was, take me to a bar. <laughs> All right, moving on. 1988, the first for female forest ranger came on the force, Patty Rudge. Fantastic ranger. She worked down in Region 3 for a very long time. Raybrook Dispatch. We have a Raybrook Dispatch here. It's operated by uh, six full-time staff. They do an amazing job for us. I'm surprised none of them are in here. Amazing people. Th this is the, uh, I guess you can call it the pulse of what we, you know, how the incidents start. Calls come into them. They call us at the dinner table. Everything we need, we call them, and they get all the resources and send them to us. I have a video of it. I'm going to skip over that just to save some time. Fantastic people. The Raybrook Dispatch, what a network of folks, and they're so helpful. Finally, I'm going to talk about law enforcement. It's my least favorite thing. Right, Robbie? So, law enforcement. For the years, Rangers, uh, they, they dealt with a number of encroachment cases, all prosecuted by the AG for most cases. In the beginning, there was very few camping rules and regs. Today, we have like two sheets of regs that, that we follow now and we can write tickets for. Christmas tree. There was patrols for catching people stealing Christmas trees off of state land. Went right to the 70s. I bet you you can catch somebody every year. Fish and game laws. Even in 1900, we were able to write those, those tickets, but we always TOT them, transfer of ticket. We, tear, we transfer the, the ticket over to the game law of the game wardens. We try not to step into their sandbox. Fire laws increased. The sign law. Basically, there's nobody out there that can put a sign up on state land on the side of the road. Even during uh, the fall voting season, you're not allowed to put those signs up. All right, so it's some time frames here. 1943 was the first documented forest ranger training down in Saratoga Springs. As time went on, rangers were brought on individually, one, two, three people at a, a year. They would go to the State Police Academy down in Albany and get their, their peace officer training at that, that location. 1972, serial killer Robert Garrow. I don't know if you've all read that book. That's another really good book. But uh, basically, he was uh, a fugitive being chased throughout the Adirondack. Started in Mariah, ended up down in Speculator. I remember I was camping with my family in 1972. And we went through a roadblock down in Speculator. And it was in regards to Garrow. Rangers were tapped into their ex expertise, their expert woodsmanship, just like Rogers Rangers. And we helped out the state police. I believe a conservation officer was actually the man who shot Robert Garrow and stopped him in his tracks. Great story. Unfortunate, but great story. Following that, the decision was made to uh, issue firearms to the forest rangers. 1994, Camp Smith was the most recent or that it was basically the first in-house six-month police academy training that the Forest Ranger Force went through. And I believe it was only 18 weeks. It wasn't even 26 weeks, like I suffered through. Uh, so then 1994, that was all Rangers. Two years later, they merged us with the conservation officers. And now we attend a six-month police academy in-house, you go, you leave the house it's on Sunday night, you drive to the facility, and you don't get released until Friday. Very intense training. 2022, the commissioner of the DEC gave us the right to separate away from the conservation officers. We now have our own training program. Amazing. 
We needed this. We needed this years ago. Gives us the opportunity to focus on our job, not two different jobs. Amazing. Class of 2022, the 23rd basic school. I went to the 12th basic. Robbie went to the 12th basic. And by the way, today is her 25th anniversary. 25 years as a forest stranger. So law enforcement, yes, we do in law enforcement. This individual got away from the, the local PD, jumped in Lake Colby, swam across loca loca uh, Lake Colby, lost his hospital gown, jumped out of the woods, ran into the woods behind Lake Colby, which is state land. It's like, oh, really? He went that way? Come on. I have one, two rangers on scene. There's a snowmobile trail back there. I told one to go this way, the other one to go this way. What do you know? He runs right into Ranger Rooney. They see each other. He turns around and he bolts. Runs about a mile and a half, runs into the second ranger. He bolts from him. But he goes down into the woods and he realizes this is not a good idea. He stopped and gave up. We TOT'd him to the state troopers. Off he goes. So we do a lot of law enforcement. We do eradication, even though it's legal now, it is not legal to grow on state land. Speed enforcement. We are actually uh, police officers now. We became police officers in 2006. So we can, uh, we can enforce all the New York state laws. That includes driving while, under, while impaired or speeding. But we'll do this at the campgrounds, We'll do this on the snowmobile trails. Law enforcement. I could spend two hours talking about this one. I guess just to shorten this up and get everybody out of here, we were heavily involved. Three-week search, we were super involved. We were in the command post. We had some overhead positions. We were basically in charge of overseeing all the... The prisons in New York State all have these special operations teams in case something goes on at the prison. They were deployed up to Danamora. The Rangers were in charge of this group. Long story short, the weekend that they got these two, Friday morning, we're in, a, we're in the command post, the big wall map, you got the FBI, you got every agency out there. People from Quantico were there. And they're staring at the map. And they're trying to figure out what to do. And we haven't got these guys yet. That same day they shot Matt. But we haven't got these guys yet. And they're just staring at this Matt. Rangers, you know, we're just, we're not trying to step in their sandbox. We're just watching, see what they're going to do. Tom Glitty. Remember the picture of Tom Glitty? The frozen face? Most gentle person you'll ever meet. He's standing behind this group. And he's so frustrated because they're not seeing the big picture. He literally parts the group, parts the group, literally splits them in half and goes, look it. He goes up to the map. He says, here's a clue. Here's another clue. Here's another clue. Four miles. You got four miles of clues. And he goes, one, two, three. You don't get him by Sunday. He's in Canada. And they all looked at him like, wow, he's right. <laughs> and what do you know? The second guy, we got him on Sunday afternoon half mile from Canada. There's some really good books on this. They do talk about what rangers did, but they don't tell you exactly what we did. Uh, so here's, here's a couple rangers leading all those docks crews. We had 500 of these guys lined up on a road doing a deer drive through the woods. So unsafe. All right, we're close, we're really close. Thanks for being patient with me. Protecting lives and resource. On the left there, you've got the, care to, uh, the forest ranger at uh, Lake Holden. And on the right here is myself up on Van Hovenberg, Mount Van Hovenberg. Then and now. The big thing here is we definitely do search and rescue. That's our priority. Number one priority is search and rescue. Two, fire suppression. Three, my least favorite, Law enforcement. So that's pretty much the end of my story here. I want to thank everybody for listening to me and having some patience.
Thank you. So, Chris just said I've got a few minutes to answer some questions. Go ahead, up in the back. Isn't it time to charge people for rescue? Yeah. Uh, for instance, New Hampshire has insurance that migrants need to have. In Europe, you don't get rescue unless you present a credit card. And, you know, that's pretty proposal. But it seems to me there has to be a reasonable middle ground where you have the option to charge people for what the rescue is. Or you could say, if somebody slips off gothics and breaks a leg, that's fine. But if the kids from this unit go out and do something stupid, that should be something that should be charged. I don't disagree with you, and I don't have an answer for you. Well, maybe I do. So cell phones now have a credit card slip. Cell phones are awesome. Now, we, we've discussed this numerous years. Decades we've discussed this, and we've looked at what New Hampshire does. We don't have any answers at this point. Right now, the recreational users in the backcountry, our job is to get them out of the woods safely into the facilities they need to go to. It's, it's really above me to make that kind of a decision. But good point. Thank you. Oh. Robbie, you got that number off the top of your head? You did that calculation for me one year. You did, which it was like three weeks ago. Oh, the white face search. Yeah, I didn't even add that one. <laughs> Sacramento. Yeah. I don't have a number off the top of my head right now, but we have done that, and it's, it'll blow you away. It's like, really, holy cow. And then what Robbie was just talking about was a search that ha occurred at Whiteface Mountain. It was a week-long search. An individual was found in Sacramento. We did a rough math on that. We determined that it cost every taxpayer in New York State about four and a half cents. <laughs> Any other questions? Paul. So, Kevin, first of all, thank you for your years of service. We do appreciate it. about fire suppression. So we're having, you know, catastrophic fires out west. Um, a lot of, you know, one of the reasons is because of the early days of the Forest Service, their policy was to put out all fires. Do you think New York State would ever adopt a let burn policy in say the wilderness areas where private property isn't at risk? Scared to answer that. <laughs> well, by the way, I have five more dates to my 25th, and I can retire as well. So there is some backdoor discussion on that currently. I don't know where it's going to go, but yeah. You know, fortunately, here in the, in the Adirondacks, we don't really have the same fire ecology they have out west different forest, different ecology, Long Island, uh, parts of the, the Catskill Preserve does have the fire ecology that can get up and run. So maybe there is, you know, maybe something we really should look at. Absolutely. Any other questions? You mentioned that the search about the Collins Carlton. There's so many searches. There's so many searches. And you know, and, and I, put all, I, put a, I put a bunch in there. I put too many in there because I kind of ran over. But after I got done, I'm like, oh, what about that one? And then what about that? There's so many amazing search and rescues that this department does. The rangers. I wish there was more rangers here that we can thank. But the rangers are just incredible for group of people that just get up from the kitchen table or, you know, the, the dinner table and go out the door and don't come back for days. 2002. Sorry, I got another story. 2002, we did have a fire season here in the Adirondacks. We had about 132 fires burning at the same time in 2002. We called it Red August. I just moved back up here from just south of Albany. We were living in an apartment at the time. And uh, first thing I do is go out the door and I go away for like three, four days fighting fire. 
I came home one day, took a shower, climbed in bed, fire, the, the alarm went off, got up, made my lunch, packed my pack, kissed my wife goodbye. She rolls over. She goes, are you just getting in? And I'm like, no, no, I'm on the way out the door again. She goes, well, I bought a house. When can you see it? <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> Kevin, what do you think the biggest challenge for forest rangers going forward is? I've got to be savvy with that answer. I think the, um, the increased backcountry use that we're seeing is a challenge. Um, you know, there's 150 of us in the state of New York. There's only about 50 of those folks in the Adirondack Park. So do we really have the staff? Not really. So, you know, when it's 32 rangers, we're bringing people all the way in from Ulster County. So uh, I think the increased use is a big issue. And the other thing is, and I'm going to get my foot stuck in my mouth on this one, but we keep buying more land. The state of New York keeps acquiring more land. Great. All for it. But we only have so many people that can do the care and custody of that new land that they're trying to buy. That's a huge challenge for us. Anything else? Go ahead. How big is the force uh, since when you started number of active rangers? Yeah, I, I believe when I first came on, it was about 100. Two years ago, we were down to like 80. And uh, that, I have to do the math in my head, but the, the last class was 38 rangers. So it bumped us up to about 150. So we were down below 100 not too many years ago. Do you have any sense for how that compares to maybe like a comparable size national park? I think the federal parks got a lot more money and a lot more positions available. So they staff it really well. They have a really robust seasonal program too. So when it comes summertime, they'll bust, you know, they'll bump up their numbers for personnel. We have a backcountry program here called the Assistant Forest Ranger Program, which is what I started in 1988 with Pete Fish. I believe we have like 20 in the state. We, we could probably use additional numbers for that as well. So in comparison, the feds, I think they have more money, more personnel available compared to what we have here in New York. Any other questions? So, a time that they were on and off again with the permit system, you know, for hiking, you need a permit to go hiking. Yeah, the, 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 yeah, the high peaks region, central high peaks or eastern high peaks, whatever, they're, they're calling it central now. Eastern high peaks developed a hiking permit, overnight camping permit. It was a self-issuing permit. You basically got to the trailhead and filled it out. It ended up becoming like a trash bin, and it really failed. So we pulled that off the shelf. Uh, there's, no, there's no permit issuing at this point. We do, forest rangers do write camping permits. So if you want to go to... Uh, they call them for three days. Yeah, that's a bad example because there's no permits allowed in the high peaks. So let's take... Uh, well, you can't even do the canoe. Floodwood Road. You want to go camping on Floodwood Road for three, four days, you got to call the forest ranger and obtain a camping permit from us. We come out, introduce ourselves, talk to you, educate you, and then give you the paper. Pretty simple. There's talk about putting that online so you can self-issue yourself a permit. It's a little less work for us at that point. I'm not chasing people down to write them a, burn or a camping permit. They can issue their own permit, and while we're on patrol, we can check your status and look and see if you have a permit. The only place right now I believe is the Osable Club that restricts. That's a different program. That's a parking. That's a parking system. It's not a camping permit system. Not a hiking system. It's a parking permit system, and it's in a trial basis right now. Because I heard that people like coming up from New York City get off the bus and want to go hiking, and if they're not on the list, they can't go in. That's, that's not correct. That's not correct. We're not going to go into those details right now. It's a pilot program, and they're learning, and they're going. They're moving along with that, but that's, that's not correct. And, and it, people have ways to go into the AMR. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. All right. We're not going to let him 
Krauss own name. And again, before he does that, we'd like to thank everybody so much for coming out tonight. We'd like to thank all the Rangers, the Ranger supporters, and Kevin. All right. Let's see if I can get your name. That would just be wrong. I got to read the number? No, let's read it. Battalia. Nancy. Awesome. She's still here? Oh, hang on to it for me. Oh, thank you. Thank you, everybody.